from Microbe TV. This is Office Hours with Earth's Virology Professor. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me tonight from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon de Pommier. Good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. We have 88 people so far. Usually we have 500 by this time. I think it's a reflection of your unpopular status, Dixon. If it we uh, assigned each 80, 88 people uh, a note on the piano, we'd have a complete set. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to another week of virology. Well, tonight it's a special occasion. Uh, I want to first thank everyone for coming. I want to thank our moderators who we have tonight. We have Barb Mack. We have PDK. We have Tom. We have Steph. Who else did I see? Did I see less? I saw maybe not, but I'm sure he'll be here. Thank you all for coming again and, and moderating. And uh, thanks to all of you for joining us. And Dixon, this is the, only the second episode of, of Office Hours. This is a brand new series. Gotcha. And I thought, as and I had wanted to have guests on this from time to time. And so... Uh, I thought you would be a good first uh, guest because you're the one who started TWIV with me, right? Well, thank you. Well, I, you started it, but I agreed to go. You're absolutely right. Um, office hours, that's that's sort of a hearkening back to your days of teaching when you set aside a certain time during the week the students could come to visit if they were having problems, et cetera. Mm, that's right. Uh, but I'm, I hope there's no problems tonight. <laughs> <laughs> no problems. Right. I, uh, as, as you know, I still teach a virology course, and I do yeah. have office hours every week. It's on Zoom now, uh, right. but it's the same idea. And so I thought um, I would open it up to the world. What do you think about it's, that concept? It's a great title. It's a great idea. It's a great concept. And uh, if you ask me to do something, Vincent, and I know you from a long time ago till till now, I would never say no to you. Really? I just want you to know that. I'm going to say that on the air. I have never been disappointed in uh, the things that you have involved me with. <laughs> no, that's good. It's true. So it's, it's absolutely true. I, I'm not sure that was phrased properly. but <laughs> So uh, Dixon and I go back many, uh, many years. Um, I do. I do. Uh, and at Columbia. And uh, I, I always heard Dixon teach the medical students. He was a fabulous teacher. So when I had the idea to start TWIV, I thought this would be a good guy to, to start it with. So yeah. I asked him, and he did it, and we recorded the first episodes, uh, he and I, right? I, in fact, uh, I go back every now and then and listen to my voice, how much it's changed over the years. Really? And how, uh, yeah, and uh, the, the rapidity of my speech and uh, the patterns that I'm now accustomed to as opposed to when I first started. And there's a remarkable change. You know, you... You watch people that have uh, assumed a high office like presidents of yeah. countries, and you see their handwriting. And in the beginning, their handwriting is clear, and you can tell exactly who they are and everything else. By the end of their tenure, no matter what, it's all scribbles, and they're just in a hurry to get to the next piece of paper to finish signing all those bills. And uh, their hair is grayed, and they sort of stoop over a little bit more than usual. <laughs> and I, I find myself in that position now of an elder, um, an elder parasitologist, but still inside, I'm as uh, old as I was when I first uh, arrived at Columbia in 1971. I really, I feel... 71. <clears throat> 1971, yeah. Wow, because right. I, uh, I came in 82. Right. And I'm sorry that the, 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 the microbiology department uh, never really um, brought the faculty that were adjuncts together with the regular faculty on a regular nope. basis. So I never got to know a lot of people that I wish I had known, but I'm glad that you and I connected and we've stayed connected. By the way, folks, if you want one of these stickers, Microbe TV, you can just shoot me an email. Do I have my email here listed? Anyway, it's Vincent at microbe.tv. Yeah. And uh, I will send it. You get. You need to give me your postal address, and I will mail it to you. All right. So, um, 
There's a question here. First question is from Polio Pete. You should be able to see these as I select them right there. Yes, Dixon. I can see that. I can see that. I was curious. Do you eat sushi? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's a that's a fabulous question because I have the right answer. Um, during my uh, years at Columbia, when I had a research grant from the National Institutes of Health, um, we had an annual meeting of the study, not an annual meeting, but yeah, an annual meeting of the study section. That's right. And so I was on that study section for four years and we would meet at a motel very close to the campus of the uh, NIH. And there was a guy there who I uh, connected with and we became good friends, John Mansfield, who uh, worked at the University of um, uh, Wisconsin at Madison. And he was a big sushi fan. And of course, you know, <laughs> if you're a parasitologist, he was not a parasitologist. He, he worked on protozoans. You couldn't even see them with your naked eye. I, I don't work on things that you can't see. I, I like worms. That's why I like worms. And if you eat sushi, uh, in the old days, not now, but in the old days, you could encounter every now and then, rare, but nonetheless uh, enough to cause a clinical problem in some people. Mm -hmm. um, and it's caused by a worm called uh, anisakids. And there are many species of anisakids, uh, and they're related to Ascaris, which is a human parasite. So the answer was, in the beginning of the study sections, we'd go out to eat, and we'd eventually, invariably, end up at a Japanese uh, sushi house and john would sit down and he would say you're going to have some sushi i said well i like the tempura uh, you know and i like the miso soup and i like the rice i said but i i, I don't uh, i don't participate in sushi I, I i just don't do it and he looked at me and he says you're crazy man it's really good so i said mm. he says let me just order you one piece and if you don't like it you know we won't go there anymore so he orders the uh, the, the tuna, right? A pretty standard fare. Nice, nice tuna, nice slices of tuna over rice with a little bit of wasabi on it. It's, it's delicious, actually. You dip it in a little bit of soy sauce and then you eat it. <laughs> and indeed, I was so reluctant that I could just see myself now, parasitologist catches parasites, who he's been teaching about for years. And now he's a, you know, I, I didn't want to read that headline in any uh, local or national, whatever. But I, I swallowed the first bite and I reflected, wow, that, that was actually a good experience. Now, I, I'm from New Orleans, and so hot, spicy food is uh, sort of de rigueur for us. And sushi falls into that category if you make it so. And so I finished the first bite and I said, John, what, what was that I just did? He said, you just had spicy tuna. You just had spicy. I said, right, order me three places, would you please? So he did. <laughs> the next thing you know, I had a whole goddamn plate of it sitting in front of me and I ate the whole thing. And I, I have never looked back, ever, never looked back. But <clears throat> because I taught to the medical students, we did have one medical student that uh, had dinner at the Four Seasons restaurant in New York. It was one of those high priced restaurants that the student went to with his wife celebrating their anniversary and they ordered some fish dish. Uh, I don't know which one, but it didn't really matter because uh, <laughs> he brought me the worm that, that had crawled out of the rare piece of fish mm -hmm. that they served. And he said, Dr. DePermier, do you know what this is? And I said, where'd you get it? And he said, the Four Seasons restaurant. I said, what did you order? And he told me, and I said, well, that's an anisakid worm. And you're lucky that you found the whole worm because, well, a half a worm wouldn't be so bad with regards to anisakids. But finding no worms and all of a sudden with an epigastric pain, I'm sort of stretching this question out. But, <laughs> yeah, the fact is that I eat sushi regularly now no matter what. And they've corrected the worm problem by flash freezing the fish in liquid nitrogen. So that kills the the anisakid worms as they defrost it. Uh, but it doesn't spoil the texture of the fish's flesh. And so that reason, uh, sushi now th flourishes mm. throughout the world. Yeah, freezing <clears throat> is the key, right? It is, definitely. Now, most fish are frozen, right, by the time they get to the restaurant? Uh, well, no. I don't know which, which restaurants. It depends. I think the best restaurants get fresh prepared fish. And mm -hmm. they can tell. How can you tell? If they if they sell you fil fillets, you can't tell. 
But if they serve you a whole fish, if they sell you the whole fish, you can tell by looking at the eye of the fish. Yeah. If the uh, vitreous humor is clear, it's a freshly caught fish. And if it's not, then it's uh, old. Oh, yeah, we bought some filet or some fish at a supermarket. And when we opened it, there was an anisakid worm in it. <laughs> That's because right. What, what is it? They, they, um, they, they, the worms start to crawl. Before they freeze it, the worms start to crawl out of the gut tract into the tissue, right? Yeah, that's way before they freeze it. In fact, when they catch it, what they're supposed to do is to clean the fish immediately and then throw the intestines overboard and mm -hmm. throw the carcass of the fish down into the hold, into the ice. And, you know, that's a, a lot of work. So what a lot of uh, fishing vessels do is that they throw the fish down, still living. Mm. They die, of course, from hypothermia. Uh, but in the meantime, as they die, the worms get this signal that something's wrong and they penetrate the gut tract and enter the muscle tissue. And that's what right. they said. Right. And in nature, um, that's the way they're transmitted to cetaceans. The, the final stage for this worm is a, a, a killer whale or a, a whale of some sort. And uh, that's how the cycle continues. Oh, that was a good one, Dixon. <laughs> hey, ask me another one. I think I By give the, the way, answer to that. <laughs> so for the first hour or so, Dixon, we'll, we're going to focus on Dixon questions, and then we'll leave the virology for after, oh, unless dear. there are no questions for, for Dixon. <laughs> no, if you want to have a good laugh, ask Dixon a virology question. Yeah, right. Here's one, <laughs> here's one for you. Dixon, just wanted to say I appreciated the grain of function joke you made on the last two. Do you remember that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did what did you say? Just grain of function? Is that it? They should call it grain. Well, if you work on wheat or rice, you should call it grain of function. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's very good. The House of Dixon. This, Nick wants to know, what are the droppers behind you? The droppers? You mean all the tchotchkes that you can see? Uh... No, there's. it there looks like bottles with droppers you know the squeeze tops that you would squeeze in. oh yeah 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 so those are india inks and uh i um <clears throat> i i wouldn't dare call myself a practicing artist but i do participate in putting color to paper and uh, part of that involves uh painting with watercolors which i love to do um and you can get some remarkable effects with india inks if you first wet the paper and allow it to almost dry and then take a dropper of India ink of any color of your choice and drop it directly into the middle of that moist paper and you will get the most amazing effects that you can ever believe because there's a solvent in India inks which is immiscible in water and you can watch it spread to a point where it doesn't spread any longer. And I wish I had a picture of something I could show to you, but I don't. Uh, it gives you an amazing effect. And then when it dries, you can follow that up with pen and ink or with more watercolor or stuff like this. So I have a complete set of uh, colored India inks that they sell. And I haven't touched it in a while, but that was a good observation, actually. So, Dix, I, was, I just wanted to tell people that you and I are toying with the idea of doing a regular show together, right? We are, we are. Yeah, no, I would, I would like that, actually. I would really like that. It would be uh, Dixon and I just jabbering for an hour, or is that what we thought? Is so, No more? Well, I, I think we have to have a topic of some sort. But, yeah, uh, yeah, we'll have a topic, you know, but it's not going to be just parasites and fishing, right? Well, let's hope not. Um, or jazz or, you know, uh, manicuring your backyard or how do you chase deer away from the... the, the uh, prize roses that your wife is growing or something like that. I think <laughs> you and I are old enough to have experienced a lot and we can draw on that for uh, reminiscences, which have perhaps some uh, lessons in life that others can benefit from hearing about. So let us know if this is of interest uh, to you guys here tonight. Yeah, we haven't decided on a title, but the title that I really love is uh, the one that had uh, the car talk guys on. And uh, they say, uh, stump the chumps. That, that's, that's, <laughs> we, we couldn't steal it, but uh, something something of that sort, I guess. So the uh, idea would be, maybe we would do it live, right? Could, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't object to that at all. No, yeah, no. Well, live would be fun. And of course, it would be also be recorded so people could listen later. So give us your thoughts and uh, life with V and D. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds, VD? It sounds like a venereal disease, right? 
<laughs> that's that's very funny. All right, let's very see. Funny. Doreen has a question for Diction. Does should your concept of birthright of clean water and fifteen hundred calories a day now include the right to freedom from preventable diseases, for example, vaccinations? Oh, interesting question. Well, it certainly does for the ones that you can vaccinate against. I mean, I think if you do not take advantage of modern medicine and modern um, uh, discoveries in the research laboratory, uh, which all focus in on the prevention and, or the, uh, the modification of an infectious disease to bring it below the clinical horizon. If you don't adhere to that, then I don't think you're doing yourself any favors whatsoever or your family for that matter. So yeah, I, I think it does, I think it does. So Bush Drive and loves you. Please always come out to play. You add so much to every twit. <laughs> that's that's very nice. Of you to say. Well, this is actually a crossover question. Have any viruses been identified that attack malaria parasites? Ah, you mean like double stranded RNA viruses? Yeah. I seem to recall. Didn't we do um, one on a twiv once or on a twip? We did, but I'm not sure if it was a virus of the malaria or of the mosquito. <laughs> I think it was the mosquito, and I think it was like dengue virus. I think one of the viruses that the mosquito can acquire actually inhibits the development of the parasite by 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 a malaria parasite by there alerting the, the toll-like receptors. In the, Novel uh, RNA viruses associated with Plasmodium vivax. Okay, okay, okay. So the answer is yes. Everything has a virus, right, Dixon? It, if it doesn't, it should. <laughs> so, so Marty says, oh, "OMG, I'm not eating fish anymore." <laughs> <laughs> no, no, come on. I have a question for you, Vincent, and that is that these big, giant viruses, right? I mean, some of them are almost some of them are large enough to be able to see them with a microscope. Why don't they have viruses? The giant viruses? Yeah. Well, they're not cells. They can't have viruses. Viruses yeah, infect well, the cell. Thank you, because the definition of a virus is that it is not alive, right? It doesn't it's have not, a metabolism. No, it's, it's not a definition. The definition is it's a piece of nucleic acid with a capsid that must enter a cell in order to reproduce. That's the definition. It does not have an energy generating system. Doesn't have that. Doesn't have membrane generating systems. Has a lot right. of other things, but not those. So no. what the heck is? It? <laughs> it's still we're still searching for a definition. No, I, I have a definition. It's absolutely fine. There are other issues that we have, but uh, not that one. Uh, uh, Susan wrenches. says, "I just want to say I love you, Dixon. I'm here for Dixon stories from your wealth of experience and knowledge. So you better tell some <laughs> stories, Dixon." Oh dear! Oh dear! Oh dear! Oh dear! Um, well, the one I'm most fond of is uh, I often get asked, what made you become a parasitologist? So let me just ask the question because it's got a very simple answer. Um, I was uh, graduating from college. I had no job. I got a notice from one of the professors at the school I went to that they were looking for somebody in the diagnostic laboratory for parasitic diseases at Columbia University. I applied for the job, and as luck would have it, I got the job, but uh, not before some nuance, which I will come to right now. So having now got this job, my first job out of college, uh, I'm stuck in the middle of Action Central. They get like 40 or 50 stool samples a day, uh, some scotch tape tests uh, for pinworm. They get some sputum samples. They get blood. They get uh, Everything comes into this laboratory for the diagnosis of parasites, and here they are, six technicians, sitting at their microscope stations, waiting for the um, slides to come out. Uh, someone else prepares them, and we then look for entities. Okay, so, and if anybody finds something, everybody stops work, goes over to that microscope, and they look to see what the other person saw. And then you offer an opinion as to what that is, and um, what an exciting place it was. So the second week I was there, the, probably maybe the second or third week, maybe the third week, we get a knock at the door um, to the lab, and of course, uh, it's got it, this one of those opaque windows with the name of the lab on it and the, the director, which was Dr. Harold Brown. And uh, any one of us could get up and answer the door. <clears throat> and so I, I forget who did that, but somebody did. And there was a man outside uh, standing there in a, uh, a, a dark overcoat, 
with some bulge on one side of the overcoat underneath, and he was holding it in place with one of his hands, and he had this uh, rather uh, disparaging look on his face. So like you might be carrying some sample of something that came out of him or something, you know, which is not atypical for these situations. Anyway, he said, can I please see the director of the laboratory? And I said, sure, <laughs> absolutely. So we went and got Dr. Brown and Dr. Brown came out of his inner office and he went over to this man. He, he said, can I help you? And he said, yes, you can. He said, I think I have something that you might want. Well, I mean, you, <laughs> all work stopped. All six technicians, the director of the lab, Dr. Kathleen Hussey, she left her microscope. She came over, Dr. Roger Williams, who was to the medical entomology. He came over, Dr. Brown sat down. We all sat down at this big rectangular table and the gentleman then opened his trench coat and from underneath there was this box. Box was about maybe 10 inches by 10 inches or something like this. And so Dr. Brown said, well, um, hmm, that looks promising. Uh, what's in the box? So the gentleman, without answering the question, uh, decided to demonstrate what was in the box instead. So he unwrapped it. It was tied with twine of some sort. He untied it. <clears throat> he then loosened the top. He removed the top. Uh, there was some straw inside, uh, some hay, something like, a, you know, or excelsior that had been divided to find money. And he reached inside, he grabbed a handful, he put on the side, revealing the contents of the box. And he politely moved it over to Dr. Harold Brown. He says, I think you might be wanting one of these. <laughs> Dr. Brown looked at the box, looked inside the box, and he said, actually, I think if you were to go down to the Museum of Natural History, mm -hmm. Uh, you'd have a better chance of selling this shrunken head. Mm. I remember this story. <laughs> uh, sh and then everybody got a look at it, of course, and the mouth had been sewn shut and the eyes were slits and they had removed the brain tissue through the nasal pharynx. And, um, and I said to myself, hot damn, I have found my home. I said, if this happens on a regular basis, this will be the most exciting life I could possibly live. And so at that very moment, I decided to become one of them. Did and it happen Harold on a regular Bradley, basis? Uh, no, actually. But, some, <laughs> but we did have enough oddities come into the laboratory. We had one guy who thought he had dog tapeworm. Well, people don't catch dog tapeworm. They catch the larval form of it, but they don't catch the adult. He thought he had the adults. <clears throat> and I tried my best. I was given the assignment of sitting this gentleman down with his own microscope, mind you, and a, a stool sample uh, that he could put uh, his stool into. And then he could look through it. And as soon as he found something that he thought was the dog tapeworm, he would call one of us over and we would confirm or not confirm it. And that went on all day long. He was there from like nine o'clock in the morning mm -hmm. until around six in the evening. And at the end of the day, of course, he had not discovered any dog tapeworms because <laughs> you can't have a dog tapeworm in your intestinal tract as an adult um, human. <clears throat> so he said, well, what do you think is wrong here? And I, I remember my answer distinctly because uh, it, the answer to his question was, I said, I don't think there's anything wrong. He says, I, I said, I think you've been cured. Mm -hmm. And he looked at me and he said, do you really think so? I said, I do. Mm -hmm. He said, you've looked all day long. You haven't found anything. You did a wonderful job of looking through your stool and you found no parasites. I think you're cured. Oh, thank you so much. And he packed his stuff up. And uh, later on, I found out that he had made it over to the next diagnostic lab in the Midtown and <laughs> was doing the same thing in that lab as he was in ours. But at least for the moment, he was... Uh, I guess, relieved to learn that yeah. he was not infected with something that he could detect. So I felt good about what I did also. I felt as though I had been useful. Patricia wants to know, do you think testing for Chagas ought to be more routine in the U.S.? I, I do, and I think they ought to just check, check the blood supply. I just, just definitely check the blood supply because that's the most common source for this infection uh, to be uh, spread between people. There's un unfortunately, there's a treatment for the blood that you could institute. It's a one to 4,000 dilution of gentian violet. And if you do that, uh, by the way, you know who discovered that, Vincent? Victor Nussenswag. Mm. <laughs> when he was in Brazil still, he's a part of a team of 
a very famous people at uh, NYU that uh, worked on parasites. And of course, he was a pathologist as well. But one of his big contributions was to find out that if you dilute gentian violet one to 4,000 in, in alcohol, and then put a drop of that into the, um, the, the pint of blood and shake it up, and it turns a light, a light blue color, then the parasite is killed. Hmm. And uh, we should be doing that, but we are not doing that. And there's more and more shy guys also. Uh, Lisa says, uh, what is, do you think of the news items lately about parasites being threatened with extinction? <laughs> You know, I read about that. I did. <laughs> and that's not the only thing, of course. Parasites won't uh, live very long if their hosts are gone. So I think that what's really going on is that the biodiversity index in the world is uh, nosediving, especially around intensive uh, human habitat. So, um, you know, there are fewer bird species. There are fewer insects. We, we had a recent trip to Romania. My wife and I were lucky enough to be invited over there. I was uh, giving a talk, and uh, we rented a car and drove all over R Romania, uh, including going to the castle where Count Dracula was supposed to have uh, held forth. And um, there wasn't one bug smear on the windshield for the whole trip. And we rented that car for a week. And so they, they overload their agricultural system with pesticides. And I think that's basically what's going on in most of the world that uh, we should be using biological control measures for insect pest control, but we're not. We're using these generalized uh, toxins, which knock out all of the ecosystem at that level. And uh, with them go the parasites. Dixon. Yeah. Dixon. Um, wait, why isn't this? There you go. Please show me some of your watercolors. <laughs> No, Vincent, you got one in the office. You could actually turn the camera around and show it to them. <laughs> uh, yeah, I do have one. I have a bunch, of, actually, at the incubator. I can do that. I'd be happy time. to. I'd be happy to. Maybe yeah. Friday when you come for TWIV, we can show one. Okay. That'd be good. Yeah, sure. Sure. Um, what's your favorite color, Dixon? <laughs> I don't have one. Uh, I have a great quote for you on that. Uh, there's a wonderful uh, glass blower who's... Uh, last name is Shuhuli, and he works out of Seattle, and uh, he has he's a glassblower of uh, renown, and he's very famous for the fact that he's got a patch over one eye because he was in a very serious car accident, and so he doesn't blow glass anymore because if he did, and a piece of glass happened to pop up and hit the other eye, then he'd be blind, of course. And he has a, he has a quote that says he never met a color that he didn't like. And I, I feel the same way. I've never met a color that I didn't want. Yeah, very good. Life with V and D. That would get attention, yeah. <laughs> That's right. John wants to know how long you've been involved with Twitter. Well, right back to the beginning, yeah. September like 2008. 2008. I was, right. My first Twiv was me and Dixon. He's That's been right. with it from the start. Exactly. And, and in, you know, in case they don't, go, go ahead. tell them the story. Tell them, no, you tell them the story. Go ahead. No, I don't, it's okay. <laughs> I, just, I, I brought a couple of mics to Dixon's office, and I had a recorder. You know, I didn't know what I was doing. So, you know, halfway through, it stopped recording, and I had to come back, and we had to redo a, lo a large part of it the next week. <laughs> yeah, we forgot um, to try and, um, But we got it to work, and, and from that success came all the other podcasts. Yeah. You know, it worked, yeah. and I said, well, let's do a parasite one. Let's do microbiology, tweeve, et cetera, and that's where we are today, and Dixon and I are going to start something else. I never, I, that's what I would like to do is just keep making more programs. I mean, we did put one to bed, right, Dixon? We did, but it wasn't really much of our fault. It was the fault of the people that we kept asking to come onto the show. And they, they said they would, and then they didn't. And so I just gave up. Yeah. I gave up. I had better things to do with my time than chase after them. Dixon, do you have thoughts about the show The Last of Us about a mutant form of fungus infecting humans? <laughs> uh, you know, the same thought as I have for viruses infecting humans or protozoans infecting humans or worms infecting humans. Um, you know, if evolution um, is worthy of its reputation, mm -hmm. then nature, nature abhors a vacuum and uh, <clears throat> there's a mutant not just of the infecting agent, but also of the host as well. 
So you can have a mutant virus or a mutant fungus that affects 90% of the population, but it's that other 10% that recovers and repopulates the entire population. And, and that's happened again and again and again. In fact, <clears throat> I once heard from an anthropologist giving a talk someplace that uh, the human species was at one point less than 400,000 individuals. And if a malaria outbreak had occurred at that moment in that region, mm -hmm. it's possible that humans would be no more. Well. <clears throat> I would have raised my hand immediately. <laughs> in 400,000 people, there might have been 10 or 12 people that have uh, the proper um, MHC complex to resist that particular brand of malaria, yeah. and they would have repopulated everybody. But we would have had a very narrow genome as a result. Yeah, it would have taken we, a while, too. <laughs> take it. Well, it depends on the individual. <laughs> Uh, Lisa says, love your description. Well, it's not coming up. Let's fix this here, Lisa. It's not your fault. There we go. It's love your description of India Inks. <laughs> to you two doing a show. I'm an art historian, artist, and generally interested in science. Love you both. Thank you, Lisa. You know, Lisa, that, that's one of the things that uh, Vincent and I have developed a passion for. Uh, I don't know where I got my passion for art from. I think... Uh, it certainly wasn't from any experience I had during grade school or high school. The art component of teaching at that level was uh, minimal and it was uh, mandatory. And you had to sit there and draw a square and a circle and a triangle and that sort of thing. But um, I think the first time I really got interested was when I started to get interested in stream insects for uh, trout fishing. And I wanted to draw them so that I could um, depict them in, I don't know, Let's just not go there. But I, I, I got not too bad at it. And uh, from that point on, I, I always liked to put a pen and pencil to paper. And I've never stopped doing that ever since. And uh, the Indian inks are just one of many ways of expressing yourself, as you well know. Uh, but they're, they're wonderful to play with. They're absolutely spectacular to play with. All right, so this uh, title, Life with VND, is getting uh, some some approvals here. Life with VND. We're going to use that title, Dixon. What do you think? <laughs> okay, as long as we don't get any nasty comments about what V and what D stand for. <laughs> Patricia is interested in vertical farming, a big fan of big band mu music. Well, you got oh, the right person you. here. Good on you, good on you. Dixon, do we know how parasites have evolved since earliest times? Is there an evolutionary tree? I'm a complete parasitic novice. Well, uh, the answer is yes and no. Um, I see you depict yourself as a cat. That's interesting because cats cats don't have too many parasites. They have very selective eating habits, as, I think, as a result. But there is one, Toxoplasma gondii, which is the world's most successful parasite. And its natural definitive host is the cat. Uh, tracing back the genomes of animals through the fossil record or for, uh, if through amber samples that you can date with uh, carbon dating and that sort of thing. Mm. It's a very difficult, very difficult, very difficult. But you can do something else and you can look at the uh, rate of mutation in the mitochondrial portion of the cell of an animal. And it, it, it apparently, I know Vincent knows much more about this than I do. Um, the rate of mutation in the, in the mitochondria is rather regular. And so then you can use it to date how old a specimen you're looking at. I don't know. Did I say that right, Vincent? Well, you can look at the genome sequence, right? And construct phylogenetic trees and see relationships and so forth. Yeah. Right. Right. <clears throat> I'm not familiar with the overall structure of parasites it's a good question i should we should find a paper and do it on one a of lot the of people was, right it's speculative a lot of it is speculation of course because there's no way that you can have the early samples yeah, uh, yeah. intact you can't have them intact but you could have bits and pieces and in bits and pieces sometimes are good enough uh at least wants to know who are your favorite jazz artists well you've been picking them on twiv haven't you yeah i have actually and uh if I had to listen to anything, only it, it, it's there's a there was a show on British radio back in the '50s called Desert Island Discos, and the theme of that was <laughs> the host would invite someone famous on, like Winston Churchill or uh, 
not Queen Elizabeth, of course, but uh, someone of that nature. Uh, and they would sit down with them and they would say, they wouldn't say who your favorite musician was or what is your favorite piece of music. They said, look, here's the premise. You're stuck on a desert island, all right? <clears throat> and you can take 10 records with you, 10 long playing records. The record player is there already. They forgot about how the electricity gets there. And you can listen to them for the rest of how long you're going to live. Which uh, 10 LPs would you pick? <laughs> and in, in, in the order of importance, all right? So yeah. <clears throat> if you wanted to ask the question that way, <laughs> which you didn't, but I can give, I never tire of listening to Pat Metheny. Pat mm. Metheny is a guitar player and uh, he's so gifted in his guitar playing, and you know the guitar is a very common instrument, so everybody has a shot at playing it. Uh, it's easy to strum, it's easy to pick out single notes, and Pat Metheny just um, devoured the instrument, basically. He's got a brother also who plays the trumpet, but his brother is nowhere near good at trumpet playing as Pat Metheny is at playing the guitar. And if you listen to Pat Metheny, you will see for yourself. He is inventive, melodic. He's like Paul Desmond. Paul Desmond is another favorite uh, artist of mine who plays the alto sax. He's no longer alive, unfortunately, but uh, my cousin plays the, uh, my, my nephew rather plays the alto sax. The, those two musicians are, are the epitome of uh, people who understand their music and want to tell you something. So um, I'm trying to think of the... Um, the experience that I had, I was at the, the, <laughs> the Lionel Hampton Jazz Concert held in Moscow, Idaho, which is an annual event. And I have a good friend that I used to fish with, and he taught at uh, Idaho State University, which is there. And he invited me to join him one year, so I did. And we heard uh, everybody. Uh, and, and so uh, the, one of the people that we heard, uh, Diana Reeves was just starting her career at that time. And there was this guy, Joshua Redman. Joshua Redman was a Harvard sociology student, a straight A student. He was going to go on for his PhD or become a great jazz musician. And he had this, he had this uh, moment in his life when he had to decide which one are you going to devote all your passion to. And he devoted it to playing his instrument. And he was describing what it's like to play in front of a large audience. And so when the, when the tune is finished, you still have to play. You have to ad lib, as they call it, ad libbing. But the point is, how do you ad lib? So he says, it's, that's the wrong question. The wrong question is not how do you ad lib? The question is, what do you want to say to the audience? What do you want them to hear about yourself through your music that lets them know something about who you are? And that was a marvelous way of saying, don't think of it as something that you have to do. Think of it as something that you want to do. And you want people to know you. And you're not willing to sit down and tell them your entire life story. That's not the deal. But if you listen to their music, you can get a really interesting idea as to who they are. Keith Jarrett is a fabulous pianist. Uh, unfortunately suffered a stroke now. He doesn't play any longer. But when, when you listen to his music, it's complicated. It's involved. It's, 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 it's mathematically perfect. That's the point. And so music is basically math to uh, sound. You're listening to math when you listen to music. And these people, these very few people, have a gift which allows you to share with them uh, how they're thinking. And so Joshua Redman, Redman's comment, then he went on to play the most amazing blues solo you can possibly imagine. Soulful. And in fact, he got to one point where he couldn't think of a note to play. So he took the instrument away from his mouth and he yelled the note. Yeah. <laughs> Which is really cool. I mean, that was the coolest thing I ever saw anybody do. He says, ha! Instead of actually playing the note that he thought he should have been playing at that point. So, so my favorite Jazz artists, artists are the ones that play well enough so that you can get to know them. And there are many like that. And uh, so, but my favorites are uh, Paul Desmond and uh, Pat Metheny, both of those. It's a shame that they couldn't have played together. They would have made amazing music. All right. Peter wants to know, what was your favorite med lecture topic? 
to present. Oh, you mean when I was teaching? Yep. Oh, I, by far the favorite one was malaria. I, I loved teaching that. And I can give you a, a synopsis. And I'll tell you why it was my favorite. Uh, it was because of a tragic death that had occurred at uh, Columbia Presbyterian Hospital, which is where I taught. And the, the death of this one person, a 13-year-old white girl from Englewood, New Jersey, was the um, the single case that I wanted every student to remember. And then I wanted them to multiply that mm -hmm. times the two and a half to three million people out there that also died from yep. the same disease. And I, I, one year, the year I thought I did the best job I've ever done with this was the year that the goddamn projector blew a bulb and they couldn't find a replacement in time and I wasn't going to wait for them. So I said, yeah, I don't need the slides. Okay. I want you to all sit back, put your pens down, close your eyes. I want you to imagine what I'm about to tell you. And I proceeded to tell them the story. Someday I'll tell that story. You did on TWIP. Uh, good. I did. Okay. Did. So that that's the story. And um, I I told that story every year. And I, I will uh, be very frank and honest with you in telling you that uh, every time I told the story, I cried. Mm. I choked up. I choked up. I couldn't quite get the words out. I, I had heard about this from a fourth year medical student who I was very familiar with because I knew his mother because she also taught at Columbia. And uh, so I knew that family very well. And he was in the room when all of that transpired. The poor little girl died and she died from, um, she died from her malaria, but she didn't die because she was given the wrong drug. She was given quinine. She was in a coma and they gave her quinine, which was the proper drug at the time. But uh, it also induces arrhythmias. And so she went into cardiac arrest. When that happened, they gave her CPR. When they did that, they ruptured her spleen. Yeah. And, and she died. So they changed the drug as a result of that one case from quinine to quinidine which I think is only different by an OH group. It has a very small chemical difference. They're both related. They both treat malaria, and one does not induce cardiac arrhythmias. And I, I loved telling that story because it all fit together into a picture. One patient times a million. That's how you develop empathy. Dixon, if you had unlimited funding at your disposal, what basic research on <laughs> trichinella would you fund? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Well, we already know what the genome is. So the next thing I would do is I would fund the research to find out what all the proteins were. So the proteome would be next. Proteosome, I guess, as they're calling it now. Proteome. That didn't proteome. exist. Proteome. When I was doing my research, we didn't know about that stuff. And... Uh, then I would find out the function of each one of those proteins by uh, actually doing um, a CRISPR-Cas9 elimination from the genome and then see what the effect on the life cycle is, that sort of thing. I'd, I'd fund that research, absolutely. I want to know why trichinella is the only organism in the world that can make a muscle cell turn into a nurse cell. I want to know why that is. That's a good question. You, if I had uh, the nurse cell up, on my screen, is there a way for me to share that? No, you can't. That's too but bad. I, but I could. <laughs> That's really too bad. I have a great picture of it. You do have and a great was, picture. Of it was the story. Nikon Small World Contest winner of 1976. I did not I take the find picture. It. Somebody else. But it's it's an amazing. Well, actually, outcome. this is this is not far. So let's. This is actually a video of yours that I. Oops. Uh, Sorry. Uh, this is it. It's not perfect, but let me share this and uh, we can see. All right. Where's the screen share thingy here? Screen share. Uh, there oh, it yeah. is. Oh, yeah. Sure, 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 sure. Uh, you know, uh, here. There it is. Here, there, there it is. is. See? That's the one. It's on the Trichinella page. Where is that darn? There it is. There it is. Isolate. There it is. Oh, How's no, that? That's it. Perfect. Absolutely. Isn't that beautiful? It is. Now, you know, in the old days, they used to call it the cyst, as if this was uh, dead tissue that had been damaged mm -hmm. by the presence of the worm, and the worm just sat there and waited for something to eat it. But it turns out 
that if you see the worm and subtract the worm away from whatever else is left, that's all altered host cell. And it's all alive. It's got nuclei, mitochondria, that sort of thing. So it's uh, it's definitely alive. And of course, if I, that's, if, that's the logo for TWIP that I... It is, it I, is. Yeah. If I never discovered anything else, that's the one thing I'm very proud of. That I actually change the word from cyst to nurse cell. And then how does a nurse cell get formed? That's the point. Uh, Andrew said, my favorite parasite is the tongue-eating louse. <laughs> you have strange tastes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Doreen says, uh, your work on Urban Ag is amazing. I'm a Chicagoan, but was living in Florida when you did TEDx yeah. Windy City 2013. Can oh, you cool, tell us cool, what cool. is new with vertical farms? Oh, my goodness. Uh, so much. Um, let's see. How long ago was that? That was a while back. Uh, the Windy City. Um, oh, my goodness. That was hmm, 2013. Uh, we're now uh, 10 years down the road. Uh, the number of vertical farms, if you pick up, the latest copy of the Vertical Farm, the 10th anniversary edition, which is used now. You can buy a used copy for about three bucks or something like this. I put a new chapter in the book to bring you up to date from the 2010 edition to the 2021 edition. And in between that time frame, there are so many vertical farms that come, have come into existence that I don't know how many there are now. That's, mm -hmm. that's the point. So it, it's gone crazy. The lighting has improved. The uh, media for growing the plants has improved. The, the varieties of plants have improved. Uh, they're not just growing leafy greens any longer. They're growing. Don't you have a don't you have book? Don't you have City 3.0 coming out, Dixon? I do. I do. I do. No. Yeah. Is that the yeah, name of it? That's... City 3.0? No. The name of the book is The New City. But uh, I, I, we'll get to that. We, we'll get to that also. Because it includes <laughs> vertical farming. Uh, by the way, did you anybody watch the news the other night, maybe night before last, uh, PBS? There have been 360-some-odd uh, attempts throughout the country last year mm -hmm. to, uh, dis, dis, uh, let's see, to destroy the energy network by destroying relay tr stations and power plants and stuff like this. So the, the grid, the energy grid, is under attack and it's very poorly defended and it's it's got a lot of, of uh, weak spots in it. Well, one of the th things about the new city that I'm writing about is that virtually every building in the new city will be able to generate their own power. So there's no power grid. There's no food grid because every, every building will be able to make food. There's no water grid because every building will collect rainwater. And every building will be made out of wood, a special kind of wood called cross-laminated timber. So that means that they can sequester carbon at the same time. And now you've got a biomimic of a forest with real trees doing what they do in the woods. A city can now do it in the built environment. And that's basically the best, the essence of the book. And uh, I, I don't think I could have ever even thought about that unless I had been involved in vertical farming to begin with. Why stop with vertical farming? Why not continue this and see where it goes? And and this is where it led me. And uh, so, Dixon, we have uh, 326 people right now. Really? To you? Yeah. Well, that's uh, that's a lot. That's twice as many as I had in my medical school classes. <laughs> what are I the wish most you could see likely parasites to get when camping and how to avoid them <laughs> um you have to tell me where you're camping first well i bet giardia is one of them right if you're drinking water you know it depends on where you're camping if you're camping in the uh, highlands of the rocky mountains and you drink pristine looking pond water or stream water that's also inhabited by beavers, then the answer is absolutely. You're running a risk for catching Giardia. But if you're camping in the middle of, let's say, the tropical rainforest, mm -hmm. then <laughs> I think malaria, if you're not sleeping under a bed now, then you're crazy. Um, there are lots of different answers to this question. That's the beauty of parasitism. Uh, wherever you go, uh, a unique uh, set of conditions exists for the transmission of those parasites, which is why we call one parasite uh, American trypanosomiasis, and we call another parasite African trypanosomiasis. They're totally different, but back in the Jurassic period when South America and Africa were connected by plate tectonics, they began to move apart. And at that point, 
those two species of trypanosomes differentiated. Different vectors, different hosts, different sequelae in terms of infection. Uh, but we know that they had to probably start together as the same group of parasites back when, back in the day, as they would say. Have you played, Dixon, with the Merlin app on the iPhone? The Cornell lab created this amazing bird identification app using the, using the phone's <laughs> microphone. I know it. I know it. My, uh, my wife's daughter and our grandson use it all the time, and it's fantastic. It is great. And by the way, ornithology is a uh, relatively new science, although I, I know that it was uh, present when Darwin was touring the world. Uh, but Cornell is credited with... Uh, bringing the world of ornithology into the modern world. Mm. Uh, they had, so there was a guy by the name of Pettengill who was the chairman of that department while I was a student at Columbia. And then we had to go to the Michigan Biological Station at Pelston. And he used to summer in Pelston and he studied uh, herring gulls. And so Pettengill, herring gull, it was pretty easy to remember. Uh, and he had students uh, studying purple martins and all kinds of other aquatic um, uh, bird life. And they would give lectures in the evening and everybody would show up after dinner and nobody fell asleep. Everybody stayed awake. This guy was amazing the way he would describe birds and, and their habits and their locations, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, birds are, are you know, it's, it's funny that we should be so attracted to birds and yet so horrified at the fact that we learned recently, not too bad, long ago, that they were all related to dinosaurs. <laughs> so this is a crossover question. How are the thousandth edition TWIV plans going? So I think I got a venue today. I have a theater right around the corner from the incubator. Um, the lady says it's available on the 15th. I'm going to go see it on Friday. It has 169 seats, which I think is good. And if it looks good, I'm going to book it, and uh, we'll we'll take the first 169 people who uh, want to go. Um, Dixon's nephew is going to play with his trio, yeah. right? Uh, quartet. He has a quartet. Quartet, before <laughs> and afterwards, uh, and uh, it should be a blast. Uh, I'm very excited. This theater looks great. It's uh, you know, it's in Chelsea. It's it's really good. Anyway. That's the plans. I'm very happy about that because I've been trying to get um, a theater lined up, and it's not my wheelhouse. So, you know, Noir but, LeBlanc wants to know what's the next country you would like to visit, Dixon? Iceland, without a doubt. I thought you were Iceland. there already. No, nope, no, I was going to go, and then the pandemic occurred, and the uh, Icelandic airlines canceled all flights, and uh, they hunkered down. They did the right thing. They tested everybody on the island, and they uh, didn't permit anybody to come in for at least six months, and they had very few cases of uh, COVID. Um, and that was two years ago. It seems like it was a century ago the way it happened. Uh, but we were going to go this summer. So for me, Iceland is the country of choice. If I hadn't uh, visited um, Portugal, then I would have said Portugal or Morocco. But I've been to those two countries recently and had a wonderful experience in both of those places. And uh, if you ask me which country would you like to go back to, uh, I could answer that question quite simply, either, either Morocco or uh, Portugal, uh, because we had such um, warm a warm visit. The people were warm. The food was wonderful. The sightseeing was great. The uh, visuals were fantastic. I got to visit where... Prince Henry uh, invented uh, navigation, basically, in Portugal, and where all the Portuguese uh, explorers shipped off to discover the world, etc. So, uh, and port, of course, mm -hmm. Portugal. Uh, the ports were fantastic too. So that, that's my answer. But I think Iceland is one of the most exotic places on the planet, and I'd like to very, I'd like to go there before I'm uh, recycled into the great beyond. Do the two of you eat pre-washed, ready-to-eat salad greens? <laughs> um, let's see. Let me think. I'd have to ask my wife about that, actually. Um, Dixon. Probably. Probably. We probably do. I don't. Uh, I wash them because I have seen mud in those bags. And uh, Have you now? I don't trust okay. them. I wash them. I, mean, I, I, wouldn't I, buy, I think you pay extra for pre-wash. So I just buy the ones that are not washed and wash them. 
the beauty of a vertical farm, by the way, yeah. is that the, the no produce dirt. does not, they don't have to be washed, and therefore they save a big step in that way. Yeah, there's no but dirt, you have to right? use sanitary. There's no dirt, of course, but you have to also wear gloves and a mask and a hairnet and that sort of thing. Are there uh, some ways that parasites benefit the host, Dixon? Oh, yeah. Well, parasites, that's... Uh, the answer is we're still deciding whether that's a benefit or whether in the long term that may not be a benefit. But, um, for instance, uh, in Africa... Um, Almost nobody has Crohn's disease. Almost nobody. I uh, wonder why that is. Because if you look for their relatives in the United States or in England or in mm -hmm. other places, outside of the transmission zone for these intestinal helmets, those people acquire Crohn's disease on a regular basis. And so the etiology of Crohn's disease is sort of attributed to the fact that throughout evolutionary history, the immune system has been... Um, honed to recognize these invaders and to kick them out. And there are a variety of mechanisms for, through which that occurs. And it's largely a gut-based immunity. And it results in T cells activating mast cells, which activate um, mucus-bearing cells that then secrete an abundance of mucus, which contained inside of which is IgA against the secretions of these parasites that are trying to invade and you kick them out and that's the end of the story but you have to keep kicking them out because they keep coming back year after year after year when you take those same people from africa and you move them to the united states invariably some people in the lineage of that family will develop an autoimmune disease in particular Crohn's disease so you could look at that as a benefit of having intestinal parasites if, with respect to Crohn's disease. To treat a person with Crohn's disease in this country, they've actually gone so far as to use um, animal versions of normal human parasites like Trichuris, Trichuris suis, Trichuris vulpus. Those are, are look-alike parasites for Trichuris trichura. And if you give those to people, uh, they will com complete most of their life cycle. They will become the target for your immune response Crohn's disease goes away temporarily as the immune system concentrates on kicking out the real targets. But if the worms are expelled, the next thing you know, the Crohn's disease comes back. So it's not a complete uh, answer to the question. But yeah, that's a great question. What's your favorite place ever for fly fishing? Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> the river. <laughs> I, <clears throat> I've often thought about that. If I had to go back to only one place, where would it be? Uh, the place that's, for me, the most pristine, that is to say that it looks like nobody's been there, but you know that's not true. <laughs> but nonetheless, <laughs> is New Zealand. So New Zealand is about as far away from everything as you can get. Uh, and um, I've had such wonderful experiences uh, fishing in New Zealand that uh, you could float for days on a river, for instance, and camp out overnight and then continue the float the next day. I've been on one river where we didn't encounter any sign of human mm. uh, humanity the whole time we were on the river. So that's an amazing. Uh, Patagonia is about the same. Uh, it's the southern part of Patagonia near uh, Tierra del Fuego. Uh, it's got just awesome, beautiful, unspoiled nature. And I think that's that's what I like. So that's that's my answer. Does Dixon have an opinion on applying pyrethrin insecticides to tents and equipment? Pyrethrin is a natural product from the chrysanthemum flower, as it was pointed out in parentheses. It's uh, photo um, disrupted by uh, sunlight so that it dissipates rather quickly after being applied. Um, Insects can become resistant to it, just like any other insecticide. Um, so would I, it depends on where you're tenting. <laughs> in the United States, you don't have to worry about it. But if you're in some tropical region where your insecticide impregnated uh, bed nets are, are the uh, routine, I'm not sure which um, uh, insecticide that they're impregnating the, the bed nets with recently. I, I don't know the answer, but I do know that uh, because of the continued use of insecticide 
impregnated bed nets that the mosquitoes have become resistant to that particular um, insecticide. So it does have its downside eventually. Nature will out. You know, you can't uh, work around evolution. And evolution says that if you pr put up a barrier to something, uh, the genome by random mutation finds a way around it. And uh, you're stuck with the same problem again. I mean, you have to reinvent the wheel. Hello, Animal Party. My dog recently had round worms. <laughs> so crazy. Which... Never knew they lived part of their life cycle in the lungs. Totally thought of you, Dixon. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's so nice of you to say that. Uh, animal party rather than party animal. <laughs> That's good. Uh, roundworms in this case would probably be Toxic uh, And that's a parasite which uh, is very commonly found in animal uh, in dogs, but it's also um, very commonly found as a larva in uh, children of dogs that have Toxic uh, and the parasite doesn't complete the life cycle in humans, but it does wander throughout the body, seeking a way out of the human host, because once it gets there, it realizes it's in the wrong host. And it travels throughout the body trying to find an exit point. It eventually ends up in the eye, and in the eyes, it can cause damage to the retinas. And, uh, and there have been some cases with heavy infections of the larval form of Toxicara, where the children have actually gone blind. So nice to be thought of, but uh, you have a dog with roundworms and you immediately think of me, I, I'm flattered. <laughs> so Dixon, it's an hour. Are you okay? You want to go a little bit more? Or are you good? Sure, Carl. I, I can talk uh, quite a bit, actually. <laughs> I've been known to. A lot of people say Desert Island Discs still going strong on BBC Radio. I like it. Oh, good. Good. I haven't been listening to BBC at all lately, but uh, I love the idea. So you can play that game with not just music. You can play it with uh, movies. Uh, if you ask me what my favorite movies are, I, I have two, uh, three, actually. One is a humorous movie called Young Frankenstein. Uh, mm -hmm. I would never grow tired of watching that movie. And then two others. One is called Lawrence of Arabia, which I think everybody's familiar with, uh, with Peter O'Toole and uh, Omar Sharif and... Uh, Lots of other famous actors uh, acting out what happened uh, during the Second World War in the Middle East. And then my third and all-time favorite movie is 2001 A Space Odyssey. Uh, if it's on, no matter what stage of the movie it's on, I just stay with that. And I just, I'm in awe of the special effects of Stanley Kubrick. All right, Elizabeth says, I've heard many humans have T-gondi and it can cause negative behavior. Why haven't we evolved resistance to it? I assume we've been getting it from domestic cats for a long time. Hmm, that's a loaded question. <laughs> I'm not certain about the data. I think we've actually talked about this with uh, John Boothroyd as to whether T-gondi has had an effect on human behavior. That's very difficult to estimate. And if you go to a country like France, where over 70% of adult French people have evidence of infection with toxo toxoplasma, uh, you might say the whole country is then behaving in a strange way, which you wouldn't dare say. So the answer is there is no uh, cause and effect data, nor could you actually do that study because it involves human subjects to find out whether or not this parasite actually does cause an effect in behavior for humans, but it certainly does for rodents. And uh, what they think happens is that the parasite in some way inf interferes with the ability of the rodent to smell cat urine. And that's how the rodents determine that there's a cat in the area. And you know, as well as I do, that male cats in particular, especially when they're uh, or is it females? I guess it's female cats because they're when they're they call it in heat. But when they're when they're ovulating, uh, they they emit a very odiferous urine, and that turns off the rodent population. It drives them back into their burrows, and they don't come out. Uh, T. gondii takes the ability to sense those chemicals and ablates it, and now the the mouse or the rat happily walks right in front of the cat without even realizing it because they don't use a visual system to detect the rat, to the cat rather. They use a chemical system. 
So uh, that's that was the original observation that caused everybody to start looking because it's such a, a ubiquitous parasite and it affects virtually all mammals that uh, surely it should be causing negative behavior in them as well. But uh, this ecological relationship doesn't exist between too many mammals and their prey and predators. So I, I think it's got limited application. That's, more, that's what I'm saying. All right, a couple of musical questions. Do you like V.J. Iyer's compositions? Never heard of them. Never heard of them? All right. Do you ever listen to a jazz fusion group called The Comet Is Coming? I do not. All right. Oh, I'm old school, very much old school. I, I don't mean to say that this is not a good group. Um, it's probably a wonderful group. Uh, I think today's jazz fusion music is unbelievable. I don't know where the human brain gets the uh, the unique expression in the music that we're hearing, but it's incredible to see someone sit at a piano or an instrument and as fast as you can go from A to B, this person has hit 18 notes and they're all in register and they're all beautifully harmonic and, and that sort of thing. Uh, I don't know how that's done. I really don't. And I know they've put people into uh, PET scans and into MRIs and given them a uh, a keyboard which is uh, non-magnetic so they can actually play and they've got the recording of their brain going on at the same time as they're playing and they still can't tell what's going on the brain that results in the expression of that uh, phraseology so to speak so we're an amazing organism uh, in that sense i mean but not so amazing that you couldn't take the cuckoo or the um, lyre bird and say how do they listen to one bird song and then they can replicate it i mean they do just uh the mockingbird does that all the time and so does the lyre bird in uh, australia it could even imitate the noise of a car so if you're close to the road and you hear cars going by it's not the car itself it's a lyre bird inside the woods that's making the noise of the car <laughs> Dick, so we have the capacity go the, ahead i'm sorry with the earth warming how long before uh, no seams in florida are host for lunch <laughs> mania <laughs> Oh, now come on. <laughs> well, you need the parasites, that's for sure. Um, I'm not certain the noceums in Florida are the same as the phlebotomans and the uh, lutzomyas. They're actually lutzomyas in the New World. Uh, I don't think we have any population of lutzomyas inside the United States borders, but the question is, if earth warming continues, will the Lutzomaya populations move north with the temperatures? And I, I, I can't answer it because I don't know what drives uh, the migration of Lutzomaya to begin with. It might not be temperature, it might be something completely different. So I don't know, I, I can't answer it. Here's another related one. Uh, are the mosquitoes that carry malaria in Malawi found in other places, or are the parasites in the mosquitoes found in various places in the world? Oh, that's a, that's a great open-ended question. Mm -hmm. To begin with, there are 1,500 different species of mosquitoes. Uh, 600 of them uh, are capable of transmitting malaria because they're anopheline. And if you look around the world to see where they're found, um, most of them are specific for geographic regions. So, for instance, uh, Anopheles gambi, which is a, a mosquito found in West Africa, in the Gambia, uh, it could be exported and colonized, let's say, South America, which it was, by the way, during the slave trade. But they eradicated it in the New World, so it's not present any longer there. Uh, it's found only in West and Central Africa. So the answer is that of these 600 species that carry malaria, there are some that are specific for the Middle East, some for South Asia, some for China, some for the United States. We have them in the United States, we certainly do, uh, and throughout South America as well. So uh, you would have to capture them and do surveys every time to find out who's available where. And each one of them, by the way, each of those 600 species, and including the 1,500 altogether, the Culex variety, all of those mosquitoes have unique biology. So every one of them has nuance, which if you understood that, you would not be able to wipe out the rest of them. You would only be able to attack that one. And so you have to really uh, choose your battles carefully as to which mosquito species you decide to eradicate. 
before you actually start the re-eradication program, unless you want to eliminate all insects. And I think that harkened back to the other question about the extinction of, of life on Earth, basically, and we're sort of responsible for that. All right, Raphael writes, Chaga is still big here in Brazil, 3 million cases, estimated yeah. only 10% are reported and treated, 37,000 deaths yearly. Wow. That's un unacceptable, totally unacceptable. And the reason for that is that the bug that transmits it, the Reduvid bug, lives in uh, situations in which animals, very domestic animals and humans cohabitate and in rather poor uh, conditions, uh, thatched roofs, um, <clears throat> mostly rural or semi-rural conditions. It's not a, an urban problem per se, uh, but rather one which is just a, on the outsides of the favelas where you would find this uh, primarily uh, rampant. And uh, of course, because Chagas disease doesn't just infect humans, uh, there are lots of reservoir hosts and uh, to try to eradicate it would be almost impossible. Well, have you heard the theory that Mozart died of trichinosis? <laughs> I did not hear that. No, I have not heard that one. I've heard he died of a lot of things, but not trichinosis. I have not heard that. I would be depressed to learn that, actually. Uh, the, the, the Columbia University had at one point in its film department uh, a wonderful um, film director. His name was Milos Foreman. And he was the uh, director of the film school at Columbia for many years. And he was the one who um, uh, wrote and directed the film Amadeus, uh, which is about the early life of Mozart. And uh, it's worth looking at, even though it, a lot of it is probably fictitious. But uh, I don't think trichinosis. I, I, hmm. I don't, no, I have never heard that one. Here's one for you. Dixon can certain. Where did it go? Where did it go? <laughs> These I things are jumping around for some reason. <laughs> oh, here it is. Can certain parasites cause red eye, swelling, e eye seepage, urinary tract infections, and kidney infection all at once in Vietnam? <laughs> Woof. Good luck. Um, uh, where's Dr. Griffin? <laughs> yeah, that's who we need. I, you know, I recognize some of those things, of course, but uh, swelling in the eye... Now, that's a, a characteristic of uh, early Chagas disease, whereas it's called a Chagoma, where the Reduvid bug actually deposits the feces containing the organism near the eye, and then the patient gets an itch and he rubs it in, or she rubs it into their eye, and the, uh, the parasite infects the surrounding tissue, and the eye swells up. I've got a wonderful um, photograph of a statue in the uh, Anthropological Museum in Mexico City of uh, just that. It's a statue that they depict everyday life with, and one of them was Chagos disease, where one eye was bulging out of the head of this little statue, and the other was normal, of course. But they don't have Chagos disease in Vietnam. They do not. And uh, urinary tract infections and kidney infections, all it was, it sounds like multiple parasites are causing multiple effects in this case. Uh, they do have a schistosome, a schistosome of Mekong guy. It infects people along the Mekong River and in other places as well. Uh, it's possible that it could induce some of this um, symptomatology, and uh, but I, I wouldn't go so far as to say that. Margot says, I guess Jerry was infected with T. Gandhi. That's why he wasn't scared of Tom. <laughs> oh, they were good friends off screen. Come on, they partied together. They both had the same kind of cheese. Yeah, you're not going to they were They were good people. Is Dix, does Dr. Dixon take patients? Dr. Dixon does not take patients, nor does he have much for people who don't have patients. <laughs> Tommy said, I got hook, hookworms in my feet when I was walking barefoot in Brazil 20 years ago. Local pharmacy had a cream that worked wonders. I could even see the worm coming out of my foot. Well, uh, that's probably dog hookworm. Uh, that's Ancelostoma caninum, and uh, it's very common. Uh, if you're on a beach, that the dogs are running up and down on the same beach and they're defecating and urinating. Uh, and if they have hookworm, the eggs of the parasite will then hatch in the feces of the dog and be searching for a new host. And if you step on, just by accident, of course, you wouldn't do that on purpose, uh, the worms will then penetrate your foot. But I mean, they won't go further than that. They will stay within the subcutaneous tissues, cause immense itching, 
and six weeks later they will run out of steam and sort of die in place but you can treat them um, with various things and I, I dare say that, that they're so small that I would question the fact that you could see them coming out of your foot although we'd have to have a personal conversation for that one all they're, right they're almost microscopic <laughs> that is it for the parasite dixon questions <laughs> did i pass <laughs> sure yes you did do you want to stick around while i tackle viruses sure. no you i would love provide that. some color commentary right <laughs> i'll do my best uh, this is an interesting one from Pete, Polio Pete. Do viruses accumulate more on facial hair or on bare skin? If so, are you more likely to be infected by a virus if you have a mustache or a beard? Hmm. I don't think so. I think the only issue with beards is that they make masks not fit as well, right? <laughs> right. You know, fit the CDC says you should shave your beard if you want to wear a mask properly. But why I don't is know. why is Pete why is Pete called Polio Pete? I said just he liked the, the name Polio Pete. You know, it's I, okay. it's in honor of me. What the hell, Dix? And I worked on polio my whole life. <laughs> this I know, but did Pete? Maybe he did too. Who knows? Uh, let's see. I know there were a bunch of uh, virus questions. Yeah, the, any perspective on Dr. Worry's paper indicating that CD4 and CD8 were activated one week, week one, and antibodies production and memory B cells were activated week two? It's a good question, and I'm going to have Dr. Worry on TWIV. So let's let him uh, answer that. How about that? I All presume right. that's a COVID question. Yes, it's a good point, Dixon. The virus is not mentioned. You're right. But, yes, it's a, it's a COVID question for sure. Uh, let's see. Oh, here's a good one. Why is it important to know about the triangulation number and the axis of symmetry when studying viruses? Hmm. Can I bring up a, a picture, Dixon? Do you think that would be appropriate? I think you better. Otherwise, people will not know what you're talking about. All right. Let's get up a uh, structure of viruses here. That's lecture four. And we have to make <laughs> it uh, available offline. And I'm going to explain why you need to know these two things, because I certainly would not teach something. <laughs> that they would not have to know about. I don't, I, I, of course, of course. Indeed, indeed. So let's get down to the icosahedral symmetry. And in fact, I'm going to go to the key. Yeah, this is a great slide. I'm in a teaching <laughs> mood now. Here we go. Uh -oh. uh, screen share. Okay triangulation number first of all this is an icosahedron and capsids many viral capsids are built with icosahedral symmetry and when you repeat subunits like this you get axes of symmetry so for example this threefold axis all it means is that there are three copies of this of the units around it the twofold axis there are two the fivefold there are five and so the reason you need to know that is because if i say to you there is a amino acid change near the fivefold axis that's involved in receptor interaction, you need to know what I'm talking about, right? So there you go. That's right. one thing. Now, triangulation number is the number of structural units per triangular face of the icosahedron. So this is a triangular face. You see my, my arrowhead, Dixon, right? Is that correct? I do, sure. Absolutely. That's the triangular face, the number of structural units per triangular face. So for example, a T equals one virus has one structural unit. Here it's composed of three protein subunits. A T equals three virus has three structural units per triangular face. A T equals four has four, one, two, three, four, et cetera. The reason why this is important is, first of all, it shows you how you make bigger capsids because all you do is insert more structural units one per triangular face, three or four per triangular face, and the capsule gets bigger. The proteins don't get bigger. The number of subunits get bigger. And but Vincent, doesn't the genome inside each virus get bigger also? Yeah, it does. I mean, that's why right. the capsule is getting better to accommodate a yeah. bigger genome. Exactly. And exactly. the other point is that you, knowing the T number, if you multiply it times 60, that will tell you the total number of subunits per virion. Okay, so 60 times T, there are 60 
uh, subunits per, per uh, virus particle. And so that is why you need to know these things. Okay, good question. Would you, does, does the viral structure resemble crystalline structures of various sorts? Well, in some cases, you do prepare crystals of viruses, right, to solve the 3D mm -hmm. structure. So they can mm -hmm. form crystals just like sodium chloride can form a crystal, right? Okay. Yes. So they're, they're, in other words, the molecules in an array. The sodium chloride's in an array. The virus right. particles right. are in an array. Yeah. Right. right, right, All right. Carol says, always enjoy Paul Offit on TWIV. Yeah. Do, what do you say to those who argue that the new bivalent is considered a new vaccine not tested like the ancestral. Well, the flu vaccines that are changed periodically are not considered new in the sense that they don't need extensive clinical trials, just a very small safety trial. And so I would say that this falls into the same category because I've really, you know, they're just changing the spike. It can be changed quite a bit, but the formulation is the same and, and so forth. So I would say it's not a new vaccine because of that. What do you think, Dixon? Does that make sense? It does. I love Paul Offit also. Offit is a straight shooter. He tells you what he thinks, and he gives you a reason for it. How are, ooh, this is an interesting question, if I can, yeah. How are pack, paramyxovirus RNPs structured? They form a coiled coil. Um, I don't know that there's a superstructure involved. I should show a picture of this, don't you think, Dixon? If they don't know what that is, I think you better. Here is a is a good one for a paramyxovirus. Let me turn on my screen share. Where is it? Here we go. Okay, everybody see that? Very good. That is the... Um, oh, I see. Is like TMV? This is a paramyxovirus, coiled coil with protein... Uh, protecting the RNA. And, and this is um, a paramyxovirus by EM, which is broken, and you can see the nucleocapsid is spilling out. There's really no, uh, it, you know, superstructure as far as I can see. Is, is tobacco mosaic virus like that? Here's tobacco mosaic virus, except it's naked. It doesn't have a membrane around it. It's just a naked okay. capsid. Yeah, but that's correct, Dixon. Okay. Well, let's turn off the. Um, I turned something off that I shouldn't have. <laughs> Tell me it? about that. Uh, where is the darn screen share? There we go. I turned something else off. I don't know. Maybe I turned your name off. Yeah, wait a minute. I don't think so. Vincent. Yeah, I turned Dixon off. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> yeah, <that's... laughs> okay, so that's the virus. Oh, this is a tough one. Maybe Dixon can weigh in on this. What's the difference think... between transmission and transmissibility? Uh, there. Well, transmission is actually uh, describing how one thing goes from one thing to another thing, like, say, a virus from one host to another. That's when you talk about transmission, it's how does that occur? Now, can it occur? Transmissibility means that even if it comes in contact with another animal or another host of a different species, it doesn't transmit or it does. So those are two different things. One is it, it does transmit, and the other one is it, can it transmit? I think those are the two distinctions that I would make. Yeah, so transmission is the is the physical movement of virus from one host to another, right? Right. Transmissibility is the extent of that, the, the, the properties of the virus that affect yeah. it. And that's right. Yeah, so I think that's a good way to leave it, yes. <laughs> If we, keep if we keep talking, we'll get in trouble. And is that the reason why, for instance, measles virus, which is a, a human-centric virus, doesn't affect other animals because its transmissibility factor is zero, except for humans? And the same is true for polio. Well, I mean... And rabies. No, no, because, rabies is because, different. Because it's the tropism. The, the host range is limited, right? So you, yeah, even if you went through limited. the air, you, you wouldn't be able to infect. Yeah. Exactly right. Here's a parasite question we skipped. Uh, the guest uh -oh. was warned to always wear shoes outdoors on a farm in the south. How frequent are livestock infested with multicellular parasites? <laughs> How? I mean, that's... So livestock, main, um, you know, because they have bare existence. feet. <laughs> 
Does, if anybody watches the... <laughs> they actually don't have bare feet, do they? Is there is there some flesh on the bottom of the hoof, Dixon, that's exposed? There is, but that's not how they catch it anyway. But uh, I'll, okay. I will describe one life cycle briefly. But um, if you watch the program, um, all creatures, great and small, the uh, younger brother of the... Um, of the owner of the uh, establishment for veterinary sciences in Scotland uh, was in veterinary school at one point and he kept flunking an exam. He passed all of the other exams except one and you'll never guess which one he kept flunking. And the answer is of course parasitology. Yeah. And he, he actually said that in this, I mean, the guy who wrote the book used that because parasites, particularly roundworm parasites in sheep, in goats, in um, cows, and in horses, are, are the main reason why those animals don't do well. And so how do they acquire their infections? And that's the, that's the burning question, right? How do they get it? They don't get it by stepping on them. That's not, they get it by ingesting them. Mm. And how do they ingest them? That's the other question. I mean, of course, you'd say through their mouth. How else does anybody ingest something? But uh, some animals avoid the local region around a uh, deposit of cow dung because it has something that repels them, uh, an odor or a smell, a smell, it's a, it is an odor, uh, a, a, a color. Perhaps we don't know, but but they will avoid a certain area around each deposit. And yet there are parasites that succeed in going from the cow dung to the cow. And no one could understand how they did this because they didn't crawl. <laughs> so how in the hell are they doing this? How are they doing this? So here's <laughs> Vincent, you gotta love this. There's a, a series of progressions of degradation of cow dung back into the soil, which is part of the fertilization process, right? There are no dung beetles up in that area of the world, so that, that's not how that occurs. But the fungi play a major role in degrading the biologically active material in a, in a, a piece of a horse manure, for instance. Only half of it is digested. The rest of it is still intact grass, which then is food for the microbes that take advantage of that. Okay, so this little parasite so cleverly evolved into the fact that as this spore from a fungus in the cow dung, say this, my hand is the cow dung, the spore starts to come up. And at the end of the spore, there's this little sack, and the stack, sack starts to fill with CO2. And this is how the fungus gets its spores beyond the cow dung to the next cow deposit. This parasitic worm crawls up on the stem of the fungus and sits on the top of this little thing. And when it pops, Amazing. the worms get transported beyond the zone of repulsion. I never forgot that term because the Scots were very big on talking about the zone of repulsion. And it's like two feet uh, in circumference around a cow dung dropping. And so then the, now the parasites can be eaten along with the grass meal. And that's how the parasites are acquired. A lot of them are by eggs, uh, and, but uh, none of them, as far as I know, uh, unless you're talking about dog hookworm, uh, are acquired by simply just stepping on them. Uh, but the parasites in livestock plays a huge role in the veterinary practice uh, in areas where livestock are the chief economic driver and certainly for uh, the British Isles and a lot of their colonies. Uh, that's basically why we have the distribution of parasites that we do throughout the world. All right. Patricia writes, in the most recent offit, it was mentioned that the adjuvant in Shingrix is the same as in Novavax. I'm wondering if this is what makes Shingrix so painful. Uh, I think it's highly likely because the pain comes from inflammation, right, caused by likely the adjuvant, although I haven't heard that Novavax is as painful, so it may be uh, something else in the, in the Shingrix. Maybe the antigen is contributing as well. 
but yeah, I would guess that the, the adjuvant's a big part of it. Okay. Would you say the only, and here's polio, Pete, the only downside to annual COVID shots are potential safety issues when reformulating with new variants? The only downside. I think a downside is that most people don't need them, right? <laughs> That's what Paul right. Offit said. If you're young and healthy, if you're 65 and over or have other health issues, then you could you should get a boost. And remember, it's going to give you a boost for a couple of months, and that's it. But, 330, uh, 330 million shots per year. That's the downside if you don't need it. And that's very, very expensive. And who pays that? Yeah, that's a good point. I knew I that's kept you here for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, somebody made a lot of money on the original vaccine. That's okay. But I think it's time now to uh, even the playing field and allow everybody access to the vaccine without having any further economic stress on their uh, budget. We heard that last night from uh, from the president, by the way. Remember, Paul Offit did say that a new, vac a new, va new vaccine, he calls the bivalent new potential s uh, safety issues. You don't know until they get into a lot of people. Not many people have taken these vaccines. However, you don't have much of a choice, right? If you if you no. prefer, you you do a Novavax when it's approved as a is a bivalent formulation, right? Right. Nicola says in the Cutter incident, Mahoney is described as particularly neurovirulent compared to other type one viruses. Do we know what makes it so virulent? Uh, no, no one has done the comparison to compare the sequences of the different type ones and make the appropriate recombinants and do animal studies. Nobody's done that and nobody ever will because you know, our ability to work on polioviruses is rapidly coming to an end. Hmm. Because of the gain of function studies. No, 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 we no, no that's there. not the reason. It's because of eradication. Dixon, what causes more diseases worldwide? Viruses, bacteria, parasites, something else. <laughs> most, I would say viruses. I would say viruses. Most deaths worldwide are, is caused by heart disease. Cardiac. Yeah, the cardiac. Yeah, That's for sure. Right. Respiratory diseases, I think. However, well, it, it could be chlamydia related. It could be chlamydia related. A lot of heart Shagas disease. related. Not enough Shagas. Okay. I mean, you've got the whole world to talk about now. Eight billion people, right? Yeah, it's true. I think so, worldwide, the uh, one of the major killers is, well, we know what they are, HIV, tuberculosis, and malaria. Um, those are the infections that cause death. Right. Yes, there's but different. death uh, per se is, that's different. I think. And uh, top 10 causes of death, according to WHO, heart disease, stroke, pulmonary right. disease, lower respiratory infections is number four. That's right. That's right. And kidney diseases are 10, diabetes 9, diarrhea is 8, Alzheimer's is 7. Really? Yeah. Goodness. I keep forgetting that one. Dixon, <laughs> it's not funny. No, it isn't funny. You're right. Uh, okay, Rach says she won't be able to get to 1,000. I'm sorry to hear that. Sorry about your death. But as I said, uh, our plans are progressing. And uh, very, I'm excited about that. Yeah. Yeah. Let's get some more virus questions here. I know there were some more down there. Life with V and D. Huh? What do you think about that? We'll try it for a while. Have I heard about the Pathogens Project? I'm, I'm sure Googling haven't. it right now. Build, build, what is it? We don't know. Oh, I see. It is a sampling program. You know, there have been some such sampling programs in the past. We had someone from one of them predict that was the other sampling one. But but this could be interesting, yeah. Uh, did you see the news about the type of bacteria that eats viruses? Maybe you're thinking of the paramecium, or what was it? The, what, was the <laughs> other, what was the other protist, Dixon? You, you plodies. No, not you plodies. It was. <laughs> it was. A, it begins with H. Um, H. Tastes like chicken gunya, Dixon. Tastes just like chicken gunya. That's right. It was. Uh, oh. Here, I got it right here. 
Small Protus. Halifax? No. <laughs> Halifax. That's a city in uh, Newfoundland. Here it is. It's Hal Halteria. 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 Listen, um, uh, well, I've lost my my train of thought now. Yeah, it was it was a protist that was eating the uh, the virus. It's very cool, for sure. Filter feeding. Filter feeding. Yeah. Yep. There are more virus questions here. I saw them. There was another you... uh, suggestion for a name, actually, for our show. Uh, oh, here's someone. This is an interesting question. I find myself wondering if tardigrades have viruses. <laughs> <laughs> I would think tardigrades. everything on the planet has viruses. So that's a good question. Tardigrades. I'm not sure if you can get enough of them to work with like that. Of course, they must have looked at them through the electron microscope, so you can tell whether they've got uh, and they've got their genomes sequenced. I am almost presume that's true too. They're very unusual animals, very unusual animals. What is it? We don't know. There's only one in the entire phylogenetic tree of tardigrades. There's one. <laughs> anyway, I'm not aware of viruses of tardies, but I'm sure that they exist because everything has a virus. They're everybody's favorite little organism, though. They almost look like a teddy bear. With a snout. Should we be concerned about bird flu spilling over to mammals? Mm. Yes, we should be. So there was just a report of an outbreak on a mink farm. H5N1. Right? Yep. Yeah. Did you see that, Dixon? Did Not only did I see it, have you ever tried to buy eggs recently? <laughs> yes. <laughs> we killed a 45 million egg laying hens, and now eggs are almost a dollar a dozen. A dollar a piece. Not a dollar a dozen, a so dollar here, each. Here, this paper uh, just came out in January. Highly pathogenic avian flu infection in farm minks in Spain last October. Uh, that's a that's of concern because um, th this is a ma mammal. Now, birds are one thing, but once it gets into mammals and it's retained its uh, transmissibility and virulence because here we have mortality rate went up in these uh in these mink this is a, a concern of <clears throat> and you know the thing is that <laughs> it's nature's gain of function the thing is that you know we haven't had all that many uh spillovers into people but now that this year there have been so many more bird infections with h5n1 and you know what happens when more infections happen you get more mutation and so that's true the likelihood that you would get a mutation that would yeah, yeah, yeah. Increased transmissibility to mammals. So, yep. yeah, we do have an H5N1 vaccine ready to go. Hopefully it will match the strain that's circulating, but my understanding is right. it, it most likely will. So if this gets into people and it starts to spread, that would be deployed. That would be good. So should you be concerned? Yeah, I think you should be concerned, but I wouldn't worry about it every day. Just worry about it on Wednesday nights at 8 p.m. when you come and talk to us. How's that? Exactly. What are the organisms that was brought up earlier about the spread of, um, of uh, sandflies, the New World sandfly, Lutzemaya? Uh, the spillover rate for animal or, or zoonotic infections with Lishmania in South America uh, was astronomical at one point because of the invasion of uh, road building to establish Brasilia. And there are a numerous species of uh, Lishmania with which, which were never before reported in humans that suddenly became a human uh, infection. So Lishmania, even though they uh, have never encountered humans, uh, have the ability to infect whenever the host is present. So that's an example of transmissibility by geographic separation, which if you're bringing the, the people together in the place where the transmission occurs, you get not just animals, but you get mm -hmm. people as well. Uh, Jem worked uh, on a master's studying the potential for biocontrol of chestnut blight fungus on mm -hmm. oak using a double-stranded RNA virus. Yes, yeah, so this is the hypovirus that reduces the virulence, right, of the chestnut blight fungus, which is a big problem. It wiped out a lot of chestnut trees in the Northeast, right, Dixon? 
absolutely. Shade trees had a big effect on the urban environment. Very big effect. Viruses. You see, they're trying to bring back the uh, American elm with a resistant strain of elm tree. How are they do, trying to do that? Uh, they're doing it in the lab. They're actually selecting elms that are resistant to their fungal infection. I and see. Trying now to uh, reestablish populations in the wild. So, uh, Dixon, are, there are many YouTube clips of birds eating ticks and yes. parasites off mammals. If the tick has a virus, will the bird get infected by eating the tick? That depends on the virus and the tick. Good answer, <laughs> I, Dixon. <laughs> but I don't even know if whether birds can even get those viruses or not. I, I would assume if they did, they would just become infected and not sick because... Uh, Do ticks this feed is on part birds of... nor naturally, Dixon? Oh, gosh, yes. Yes, oh, okay. Well, there are certainly, there are certainly cases of um, ticks transmitting viruses among rodents. And yes. so it's possible, but you know these birds, mammals to birds is a tough jump, not 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 zero, but it's a tough jump. But it could happen, yeah. And you know, it might be happening all the time. But who studies it in in the wild, right? We don't. <laughs> we right. Certainly don't. We have do enough it. trouble with bats. <laughs> we do have enough trouble with bats, but but birds are quite numerous, Dixon. They are. All right, bats are twenty percent of mammals. Um, rodents yes. are 40% of mammals. Right. And birds and are what percent of birds, Dixon? <laughs> <laughs> they're 100% of the new forms of dinosaurs. <laughs> yes. I'm, uh, there, how many different bird there, species are there? Oh, many, right? I, I think around 4,000. I lost count, but uh, if you look it up, I'm probably wrong. So could we uh, compare the number of birds in the world with the number of bats? you have any idea? Uh, why would you want to do that? Well, does, you don't have to ask why. You just need to answer the question. <laughs> number of birds in species. the world. Species. Yeah, I want numbers. I want real numbers. Yeah, six, you're going to get them. Six birds for every human on the planet. 50 billion birds. No, no, that's numbers of birds. How many species of birds? Well, I don't care about the species. I want to see now number of bats in the world. How many bats are there? There are lots. Uh, a billion is one estimate. Okay. Right. Without bats, you would have an insect problem like you wouldn't believe. There's a lot of birds and a little bit less bats, but also... Oh, <laughs> Vincent, I think I have a factoid here. Uh, there's one species of bird in Africa, which is the most numerous of any uh, hmm, of any vertebrate, I believe. Mm -hmm. There are like two and a half million or something like that of this one particular bird. Now you could look it up. Bird. I mean, you could look it up. I could look yeah. it up. All right. Uh, I mean, some birds have very few numbers to their uh, populations, you know, like uh, rheas and uh, emus and uh, ostrich and other birds, and eagles and predators, but other birds like the passerine birds, parrots, yeah. Uh, sparrows, wrens, they're very numerous. They are the food for the other birds. <laughs> this, um, the twip with the Dixon's malaria story, I have to look it up. Could the, well, could Les uh, write it on a sticky or, or one of our mods to find the malaria story? Because you did tell that story one times. Oh, it was called one times. Twip, what was it? One times, <laughs> times, times a million. A million? Let's see if that picks so. it up. No, oh, one times three million. Three million, yeah. One times three million. It's uh, TWIP 11. Oh, my gosh. Way back when. I'm going to put this in the uh, in the chat right now, folks. Here you go. That's yeah. for you. There it is. One time. I got it. Wow, because it was TWIP 11. Dixon, that was a long time ago. It truly was. Dixon, what is the most convincing argument you heard from a grad student for a new project that you were skeptical about? <laughs> no, I don't. A, a convincing argument, <clears throat> that's not the way I judge things uh, by argument. I judge them by um, whether or not it's a worthwhile subject 
and then whether or not it's a worthwhile approach to that subject. And we, we carefully sit down and we go through, uh, A, I don't care why you selected the project. You had a, a passion for it. It resonated with you and you want to work on it. That's fine. Uh, and in fact, uh, my uh, mentor at Notre Dame, where I got my PhD, had virtually no interest whatsoever in parasites, none, <clears throat> but said, as long as you do good science, you can work in my lab. And I took that as a, um, a challenge. Uh, if you do good science, it doesn't matter what you work on. So I think that's a convincing argument would mean, does your um, approach reflect good science? And it's pretty easy to tell whether it's highly speculative or whether there are the tools available mm. for you to actually try to answer that question. And a lot of questions that people want to know the answer for, the tools to get to that answer don't exist yet. Uh, like, is there life on other planets, for instance, and that sort of thing. So uh, it has to be realistic. And of course, the most convincing argument was you could do it in four years. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. if you don't, you're probably not going to get your degree. Um, so I think a, a worthwhile project that's well thought out, that's within the four-year range limit, uh, would be anything I would support. I would, um, sure. As long as I had the money to support it. And that's the other problem, of course, is that how do you pay for this? And the answer is you can't answer every question that's asked. And NIH knows that already. So they earmark certain amounts of money for questions related to issues that they want solved. And they send out an RFP and people answer that RFP and they get a grant on that subject because they have the tools and the passion for answering that question. Uh, and then once they answer that question, or if they think they've answered the question, they move on to another another question. I never did that. I just stayed with the same organism. And every time I went into the lab, I could think of brand new questions that the same organism would elicit in me that had something to do with how a nurse cell develops or what the secretion products do that the parasite is secreting into the host or uh, how even the worm carries out its life cycle in the, in the gut tract. Uh, all of those are valid approaches. If a student wanted, we, we had one student that wanted to know about um, how the circulatory ready, that's R-E-T-E, forms around the nurse cell. So I'll just demonstrate with my hand. Here's the nurse cell, and here comes the host circulation. And as it comes in, it completely surrounds the nurse cell and makes a connection so that the blood circulates around this tissue that's been altered by the parasite. And the purpose of which is, of course, to bring in nutrients and to, and to allow waste products to, to be gotten rid of. So she made clear plastic casts of the circulation of an infected mouse and then digested it with Clorox. And the only thing that was left were these uh, skeletons, each one of which was a cast of the circulation of the mouse. And if you broke open a piece of muscle and did that, that was infected, you could find these very interesting looking little baskets of circulation, minus the nurse cells inside that were all digested away by Clorox, but you could now see the fine structure of the circulation. And that's where we got the idea that this parasite is really a true parasite. It elicits that circulation from the host. It can't make a circulation. So it has to ask the host to make it for them. And that, for me, that was the hook that just sold me on the fact that uh, this is a worthwhile organism to study to see uh, how it carries out its life. And the woman who asked the question, what does the circulatory ready look like and how does it form, had no interest at all in the parasite per se. She was interested in microcirculation. So that's how that comes out. In fact, the study almost costs nothing to do. <clears throat> Is, are there any other viruses linked to that cause cancer besides HPV? Absolutely. Oh, gosh, 20, yes. Like 20% of human cancer. Let's see if we can get through them all. First, we have HIV. We have right. hepatitis C virus. We have right. hepatitis B virus. We right. have Epstein-Barr virus. Right. We have Merkel's... Merkel polyoma virus. All right. Show uh, papillomavirus. 
No, the human cancers, not 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 non-human cancers. Oh, okay, okay. EBV. Uh, Any memory tumor viruses? No, it's it's not human. It's mouse. Yeah. Kaposi's sarcoma. Thank you very much. Good. That's six. Uh, I should get my <laughs> my lecture up here, shouldn't I? <laughs> yeah, let's do that. Let's get the lecture on uh, transformation and oncogenesis. That would be, well, oh, that's going to be like way down on the list, I think. What what do you think is the number, Dixon? Do you think it's 19? Vaccines right. is 19. So that would be transformation and right. oncogenesis. All right, here we go. And this is going to have the slide with all the viruses, so I don't have to stumble around <laughs> and miss them. That's here why we, we make them. Uh, how many viruses? Let's see. Here they go. Here it is. Folks, I got it. Screen share. Pardon me. Here we go. So RNA viruses, HTLV-1, HIV, hepatitis C, EBV, Kaposi's, Hep B, Papilloma, and Merkel. So, yeah, I just missed Kap uh, Kaposi's and the HTLV. There you go. Anyway, yes, those are all involved as far as we know, Carmen. Thank you for that question. All right. There were some more virus questions here. And by the way, folks, this kind of thing that Dixon and I are doing, that's what you would get on our show, right, Dixon? It's a ramble. It's, a, it's kind a of science. you ask questions. You just Science ramble. Dixon goes riffing. I call it riffing. Riffing is good. That's a jazz term. That's very good. Well, like here's, a, here's a tip about Iceland. When you go visit Thingvillur, where the original oh, yes. Athing or Parliament was held, a fault line. Amazing. Right. Is I believe there's cool? a lake a lake named after it also. It's not too far from Reykjavik. Susan <clears throat> says, we can hook you up with very nice people there who will take care of you. Oh, I like that. Oh, let's stay in touch because we're going to leave in late August and probably be gone for two weeks. Going to tour the whole island and have a wonderful time. When are you going? Uh, last week in August, first week in September. So no <clears throat> twiv, huh? Apparently not. <laughs> you, I won't be missed, I can guarantee you. I won't is missed. this whole show about worms tonight? No, not at all. No, not at all. That's right. I'm taking no, a pharmacology it, right? class, and the textbook says the COVID vaccine is a passive immunizing drug. No, it's not accurate. The vaccine, well, the the active vaccine, so we have two kinds of vaccines. We have active and passive. Active vaccines are parts of the virus or the whole virus injected in you that induce an immune response. Passive vaccines are like convalescent serum where the antibodies are injected into you. Okay, so that's the difference. We call them active or passive vaccines. Many people don't use the word vaccine, but in our textbook, it's an active or passive vaccine. So if they're causing it, uh, calling it the, the COVID vaccine, it's not correct to say it's a passive drug because it's both, mostly inactive because passive isn't used very much anymore. Convalescent serum and so forth, not used anymore very much. Although um, Arturo Casadeval is coming on TWIV in a couple of weeks to talk about passive uh, immunotherapy. And someone asked about influenza. So Friday, Dixon, we have a flu guy coming on, whose name I can't remember. A flu guy? Oh, I can hardly wait. <laughs> Did he Where's come in through the window? <laughs> His name is Scott Hensley, and he made the... Um, the, the mRNA vaccine against all the different flu ah, kinds, and we're going to talk to him. And we might as well ask him about H5N1, right? You bet. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, some people have died from H5N1. Yeah. It's a, I know that's true because a, I was in Vietnam. Yeah. I sent yeah. you a slide of a post which had a stenciled skull and crossbones with the H5N1 under it. And We've that had about 500, had... 500 deaths out of 800 human cases. Yeah, someone had died in that, uh, in that area from H5N1. But it has not adapted to become a common virus of humans. Not at all, no. 800 cases, human cases, is not a human infection no. whatsoever, right, Dixon? That's, that's correct. But in some diseases, two people represents an epidemic. That's plague. If you go out west, one case, too bad. Two cases, epidemic. That's the two way cases is an epidemic? 
Yeah, because they're likely to be more. <clears throat> if you got one, you have two. Now you have. Now that means something else is going on, maybe. When they react well, to something, it's an outbreak. Well, you know. Um, the prairie dogs yeah, died from the, it. The expectation <laughs> of. <laughs> it's not really an academic. <laughs> No, but it, they have to. They have to go on red alert at that point. That's the point. Mm. The same thing happened with West Nile virus in New York City. They had several cases in Queens, and they thought it was coincidental. But then they had three cases in Queens, and they knew something was going on, and indeed something was going on. On Twiv, you're talking about viruses as a food source. Would we expect them to have flavors? <laughs> That's why it tastes just like chicken gunya. <laughs> Someone said, will, will the flu guy come down the chimney? <laughs> Try the veal. I'll be, I'm here all week. Try. That's, that's exactly right. Um, I don't know if they would have flavors, but yeah, there were COVID sniffing dogs, but they were smelling the organics that a person would emit on being infected. They would swab your underarms, for example. So they weren't really smelling the virus. They were smelling volatiles that you make, right? Right, right. Yeah, well, yeah, an N95 won't seal with facial hair. Yeah, I mean, you know, Dixon, I'm thinking of shaving. What do you think if I shave? <laughs> Nobody would recognize me because I have <laughs> no, never had, I've always have a, had a beard, right? Yeah, I, I've had a beard for a long time also. I would like to hear the host's opinion on the likely origin of SARS-CoV-2. There is no oh. question that SARS-CoV-2 would... came from nature. It came from a bat. That's and it right. spilled over into people at the Huanan Seafood Market in Wuhan. And that's right. it. You may have seen an article today in the uh, Wall Street Journal, right, Amy? Amy's listening. I know she's listening. That said, <laughs> we have to reopen the investigation. This is the highest level of BS, folks. We don't need <laughs> to open any investigation. This could not have come from a lab, period. Period and period. Dixon, it could not have come from a lab. What do you think, I Dixon? I don't think it came from a lab. <laughs> I will say this though: even if you decided to open an investigation, the Chinese wouldn't let you. This well, that, yeah, it's fine, time. but I don't think we need one. We don't need an investigation no, course, because I think it didn't come from a lab. <laughs> a long time ago, the horses have left the barn. A long time. And ago. And you can you can argue till the cows come home. That's exactly their, right. They're parasites from the <laughs> bubbles coming out of the, from the zone of revulsion. That's right. Oh my I gosh. Agree. Yeah. Oh my well, gosh. we've covered quite a bit of territory here tonight. Uh, yes, we have quite a, and we're going to wrap it up in just a few minutes. I would love to come to New York to see the incubator. Uh, it's a long drive, but it would be epic. Yes, you're welcome to come. I'm sorry it's a long drive, but for TWIV 1000, many people are going to fly long distances. So, uh, if a parasite can protect me from COVID, do I need to vaccinate? I don't know of any parasite that can protect you from COVID. Do you, Dixon? If I did, I would have said it a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Um, are there viruses that require two particles in a cell to reproduce. Yeah, there are actually. Um, some viruses require two or more. Because helper, the genomes, helper viruses. The genomes are either helper, yes, that's an example. You have a virus that needs a helper, or one virus where the genome is packaged into separate particles, and sometimes like more in, than two. Like influenza. And then they, well, you know more than I do. Go ahead, say what you're going to say. It's fine. No, the, the genome is segmented. That's all. That's that's the only lesson. Yeah, I but they're all in the same particle. We're talking about when a virus, the genome is actually separated in separate particles. You need both oh, to infect the cell. Yeah, right? We reviewed a paper about that a long time ago on Twiv, and I, I, I'm blocking on the... Uh, but I, I remember the concept. I do remember the concept. Have you... And in which episode talked about research that involves using viruses to treat uh, bacterial infections? Yes. In fact, we uh, we went to D Dixon. Did you come to Texas with us for five hundred? I sure did. I flew in so, from China. <laughs> don't you recall? So, no, I don't recall. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm getting worried about you, Vincent. Um, <laughs> yeah. I flew in uh, so five oh one, we recorded at Texas A and M, where one of the labs that work 
on Stephanie Strathdee's husband to treat him with a bacteriophage for an acinetobacter infection. So that would be TWIV 501. But more recently, we did a TWIVO uh, on that as well. TWIVO Paul Taylor with, uh, with nails. That would be the enemy of my enemy is my phage. And what right. episode was that? Tuivo number 44. So take those and listen to the Mihela, and you get a lot of info on that. So there's a woman at Rockefeller. Her name was Rebecca Lansfield, and I believe that she was yeah. the one who popularized the use of phage for typing bacteria, but also mm. as a potential treatment for salmonella and other enteric uh, pathogens. Yeah, I knew. Yeah, I, I Rebecca actually Lansfield, got to meet her. Yeah. Wasn't ivermectin used to treat river blindness, Dixon? It certainly was. It certainly yeah. is. Still is. And uh, there are still some countries in South, in West Africa that refuse to uh, accept the free drug because because they have to keep track of the epidemiology and they don't want that data being re released. So uh, it's unfortunate that there will always be river blindness in West Africa. All right, let me just put this to rest. Don't think it was created in a lab, but see no reason why working in a lab would be discounted because nobody had it. Nobody <laughs> had it. Do you get it? Nobody had it. Nobody had a virus anywhere close to SARS-CoV-2. Don't you think they would have published it if they had? The Wuhan lab published all of their isolates. They didn't even isolates. They're sequences. They published them and it's not there. Yeah, Sure, it could happen, but they didn't have it. That's the key. They didn't have it. Do I have to say it again? They didn't have it. I can't stand this nonsense where people think, yeah, well, it could have been there. That's not a theory. You have no evidence for it. In fact, we have more evidence that it arose another way. There's an epicenter around the market. If, there were, if it had come from the lab, there'd be an epicenter around the lab, and there wasn't one. Come on, folks. Aye. <laughs> the same was true for SARS-1 in what southern about China. What about, what about the SARS civets? The civets, they found evidence for the infection in civets as well. Now, I'm not yeah, sure yeah, that's where the original sure. infection came from. but uh, So the civets actually got infected yeah. in the countryside, yeah. presumably by bats, and then they were brought in. And there were there multiple go. civets, not just one civet. And it's the same that's thing right. here. There were multiple... Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, multiple... Yeah. Uh, uh, raccoon dogs or whatever. We don't even know what they were. But the epicenter was at the market, folks, not the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Come on. Okay. I'm sorry. It'll be fine. Just don't, be fine. There's an article today in the Wall Street Journal, Dixon, I saying we have to re reinvestigate. This is ridiculous. We don't it. have to reinvestigate, folks. It's done. All right, folks, that's it for riling up Rack and yellow. Life with Riley. <laughs> I want to thank our moderators for tonight. We had Peak PK, Peak Dunning Kruger, PDK. We had Bard Mac. We had Vanity Nutrition. We had Steph. We had Les. And we had Tom. And I guess I should be timed out <laughs> because I ranted. But I'm sorry. I can't take this. And I want to thank all 326 folks came tonight. And we have 300 fun. likes. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Dixon, for coming and spending two hours with me. Appreciate it. Ask me again. I'll come back. And uh, I will ask you again, to, and you'll come back. And uh, we'll have some other guests as well. And next week, whatever Wednesday is, 8 p.m., I will be back by myself uh, answering all of your questions, attempting to answer all of your questions. And... Uh, Meanwhile, Dixon, just stay put while I close this down here, and uh, I'll, I'll say goodnight to you. Thanks, everybody. See you next week, uh, and be safe, folks. Good night. Good night. <clears throat>